Well, welcome. We're thrilled to have you here. It's wonderful. This is our second, sun, the second, second Sunday Garden Forum for the spring. And we're always just eager at this point to get into the garden. So I, I know how you all feel. It's, you look out the window and think, oh, can it come soon enough? Probably not, huh? Our forum today, as always, is, is given in partnership with the Iowa City Public Library. And we are, we cannot tell you enough times how thankful we are for that partnership. Beth Fisher helps us so much uh, as representative for the library. And um, we are very excited about these forums because they are our gift to the community of Iowa City and for all you other folks that come from distant places. Uh, we feel that, our, that the Project Green is about environmental excellence. And environmental excellence comes hopefully when we plant in the city or when we, we fund the planting of, of landscapes, of streetscapes, of parks, of all the schools where we've had cooperative agreements with the kids uh, and with the people in the school so that to help them with their landscaping. All these ways bring a better environment to Iowa City. And pretty soon those, those flowering trees will start perking up our streets and as you drive down Melrose or Dubuque or Iowa Avenue or Highway 6 Bypass and a number of other places or when you go by the schools, when you see those flowering trees, I hope you'll think Project Green because in many, many t respects, Project Green has been responsible for those plantings. <coughs> Our generosity to the community only takes place because of the community's generosity toward us. And so when you're thinking about your donation dollars, I hope you'll remember Project Green because it's only because of those funds that we're able to do what we do. Thank you for the, think, let's, listening to that little spiel. I want to thank, as I said, Beth Fisher because of all of her work from the public library. Ty Coleman and his crew, Eli, Brett, and Nicholas are responsible for getting our sound set up ready today. And they are filming this for the library. The library has a wonderful collection of, of nonfiction videos, and uh, among in that collection are our. Is that okay? There's a little ring. Um, okay. Um, in that collection of non of nonfiction videos are are films of all of our forums. So if you look back on a forum that that was particularly meaningful to you, or that might have had some information that you'd like to use please head for the library and check out the videotape of that. This videotape of, of, our, of our forum today will be ready in a few weeks, so don't go down this week, but they'll get it ready, and, and then you will be able to, you can check it out again and again to get little bits and pieces that you might have missed along the way. I want to thank Rob Med, who is a band leader here at West High School and the fellow who's in charge of this auditorium and the large auditorium that's so busy down at the other end of the school. He has worked so hard and met with me several times and given up his time, so he's really been a wonderful help for us. <clears throat> As I said, this forum is being taped. It is not being broadcast today, so you're the lucky folks that get to hear it. I, I hope you each were able to have paper, paper and pencil so that you can write down any questions you have uh, during our presentation today, because we'll have our question and answer period later. Because this forum is being taped, it's difficult to hear questions offered verbally by you in the audience. And that is the reason that we write down questions and then I'll read them and, and, and uh, Gordon can answer them. Uh, but that's why we ask you to write down your questions rather than plan on asking them from the audience. Now this is a good time to think about your cell phone. Do you have a cell phone in your pocket or in your purse that you forgot to turn off? Uh, we just, we'll hear little dinglings and and songs throughout the audience as people turn off their, their phones. But it'd be nice to have you turn them off, please. If you could. A year ago, Ann Hesse, Lynn Gardner, and I were lucky enough to go to the Horticulture Magazine Symposium in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we went to this not realizing, of course, who we were going to hear, but it was a wonderful day. We, they had four or five speakers, and one of those speakers was our speaker today. And on our way home from, from the symposium, of course we were rehashing the things we had heard and the things we had done that day. And we kept talking about Gordon Hayward. Wasn't he just the best? He was so wonderful. 
Well, we didn't have any idea that in a year we'd be able to have him here as our speaker. And I am just so delighted that he's with us today. I want you to know a few of the things he's done. He's a, he's a first of all, a teacher. He's a teacher in so many respects. He was a, a high school teacher. Was it high school or junior high? High school. High school. He was a high school English teacher long ago. But he's grown from that kind of teaching to the garden design teaching. And uh, he's excellent. He's also uh, an author. And you can tell by his books that we have for sale out on the tables. The, the books that are out there are The Stone in the Garden, Stone in the Garden, The Intimate Garden, Your House, Your Garden, and The Welcoming Garden. The Intimate Garden is written about the wonderful acre and a half garden that Gordon and his wife Mary and son Nathaniel have developed in Vermont. And it's charming and it has so many aspects to it. You'll have to see the book to really understand it. And you'll certainly today see some of it, I think, in his uh, presentation. The Welcoming Garden is about entrances, the entrance to your home or to the place that you live. And uh, that only has been out for three weeks. So that's a, it's wonderful to be able to have that here today. His articles can be found in the best garden magazines. Look for his article in the fine gardening magazines he brought today. Uh, he has given lectures and design workshops throughout the country. Please welcome Gordon Hayward. Thank you very much. And thank you, Melanie and Bruce, for your hospitality last night. That was a great pleasure. Um, as I understand it, I'm, uh, Melanie, is this correct, that I'm to uh, speak for about an hour, that is till about 20 past 3 or 3.30, thereabouts. Then we'll break for 15 minutes, and then there will be a 45-minute question and answer uh, period. Okay. Um, what I'm, uh, I, among other things, am a contributing editor at Fine Gardening Magazine, and uh, Todd Mayer uh, has sent out copies for all of you. I hope you all got a copy. Uh, the reason that uh, I wanted you to have this is that on page 66 is an article I wrote about one of the, uh, uh, it's about theme and variation and how that principle can be used in your own garden. So that's why you have that. The article that more particularly relates to this lecture appears in this month's issue of Horticulture Magazine um, I have divided loyalties. I've been writing for horticulture for 26 years. And uh, so if you're interested in a, a summary version of what I'm going to be saying today, I have a piece in this month's issue of Horticulture Magazine on not being afraid of straight lines in the garden. Uh, this is the subplot of my lecture today. Um, the the lecture that I'm going to give you now is based on this book, Your House, Your Garden, which the American Horticultural Society last year was kind enough to award uh, for one of their top five books for 2004. So I was very pleased to uh, get that. As my wife, who is English, said, uh, she was chuffed. Uh, so the lecture is about your house and your garden. And I know, as well as anybody, that you have come here with the hope that you will go home with ideas for your own garden. And the only way that I can illustrate and help you understand the ideas that I am exploring is to show pictures of everybody's house but your own. And this is one of the disheartening things about coming to these lectures, is that you think this is the lecture where my house is going to appear on the screen and he's going to do a 10-step analysis of what I need to do and then I'll know what to do. Um, sadly, I have not been to your house to photograph it. So what I am doing here is I'm going to show you about 40 pairs of slides that walk you around the front of your house, down both sides of your house, to the back of your house, the gardens in an L or courtyard, if you have one wing coming at a right angle to another wing in your house or a garage that meets the house at a right angle. I'm going to look at the space between buildings, a house and a barn, a garage and the house. And finally, 
gardens around small structures like garden sheds or garden uh, gazebos or arbors or whatever uh, small buildings you might have in your, in your landscape. And what I'm doing in showing these slides is to help me illustrate design ideas that I hope you will be able to put to work in your own garden. And what you have to do is not sit there and say, there's a house in Pound Ridge, New York. It looks nothing like mine, and I don't live in Pound Ridge anyway. I can't wait for the next slide. Rather, what you need to do is listen to what I have to say and constantly be thinking about your own house. Don't get lost in these pictures. They're just up there to help me make a point. So another point of this lecture is how do we look at slides or pictures in garden books and in garden lectures and learn from them. Research shows that we spend between five and eight seconds in front of any painting that we go to see in the great museums of the world. Five to eight seconds is what we'll give Cezanne or Picasso or whoever it might be. You can't learn anything in that short a time. So my argument in this book and in this lecture is that you have to see these images in all these beautiful books that you buy by all of us garden writers and you take them home and you look through and you don't see your own house in it, you don't see a house in Iowa City in it, and once again you're vaguely disheartened. The book stays on the, on the coffee table or it goes into your shelf and you just hope the next book you buy will help. <laughs> so I would say that you have these wonderful libraries at home, you subscribe to Horticulture or Fine Gardening, I hope that what you will learn in part from this lecture is how to look at those pictures. And my job is to do that for you, is to walk you step by step through these images and learn a, a how to think about your own garden. Now, I've got a certain take in this lecture. I grew up on an orchard in Connecticut. My wife grew up on a diversified farm in the Cotswold Hills near Chipping Camden in Gloucestershire. We and I am I'm a designer with my feet on the ground and a shovel in my hand. So this is not a lecture about fancy design. This is a lecture about how you can make your house the center of your garden. And the central point of my lecture is that your house is the center of your garden. And this is a very practical notion. That is, that the doors of your house lead to paths that go out into the garden. Windows in varying degrees of importance establish view lines from the house into the garden. This is a lecture that goes directly to the heart of what this word home means. And what we typically think about when we think about home is our house. And I'm encouraging you to think about your whole garden as part of that definition of home. And one of the problems of seeing your house as separate from your garden is foundation planting, is gardening at the edges. As we look for places to put our plants, we go to the edges of the house, the edges of the lawn, the edges of a little garden shed. Um, and what, we res what results in that process is that we walk past our plants, not among them. You hear that? We are walking past our plants, not among them. Now please don't think that what I am doing in this lecture is making you feel awful about your own garden <laughs> and that you've all got to go home and change everything or I'm going to be unhappy with you. That is that my job here, as I see it, is to, is to give you a new way of thinking about how to develop your new or existing garden in light of who you are, where your house is, how much money you've got uh, to spend in the garden. And it's really easy for me because all I have to do is say, Build a new set of steps to the front door. 
and off I go to, to fly back to Vermont, leaving you with a $3,000 project. And that's only one of 48 I'm going to suggest to you. So you've just, don't, please don't feel bad about your own garden as, as you measure it against what I'm saying. I'm just trying to help you with a new way of thinking. And fundamentally, what I'm about is that America has gone curvy bed mad. It's almost as if the straight line is against the law in American gardening today. So if we believe that the house is the center of your garden and that your garden is there to extend the house out into the landscape, that is a completely different way of thinking about the garden as opposed to planting beds that curve and willy-nilly head off in all sorts of directions to pretty up the place. So if you are a beginning garden designer, you're trying to find your way in this, I think this will be a hugely important lecture for you because the American Horticultural Society seems to agree with where I'm headed. And basically where I'm headed is back about 100 years. This is classic garden design. I am not here to encourage you to, to think that I have I've hit upon some amazing new way of thinking. This is just old fashioned, good, solid garden design based on the fact that your house is a big geometric structure, the geometric structure in your house. Gardens near it need to answer those shapes of the house, proportions of the house. So here's what, uh, so I'll start walking you through what I mean. Now, would you rather I sat down? Because my head is right in your way. You're all okay? Because I can sit down if, I'll move around a little bit, is that all right? You would like me to sit down, okay. <laughs> Nothing personal. How's that? I, I feel too professorial down here, but okay. Uh, now, are the lights okay for everybody? Or would you rather they be down a little bit? Can we put the, to, put, put the lights down a little bit, or do they have to go off all the way? Oh, wonderful. Yeah. How about a little lower? And what about the cold air coming through that door? Are you folks okay with that? <laughs> it's wonderful? Okay, good. All right, now don't forget your own house. Don't get lost in these pictures and get depressed by these pictures. Just stay with your own house. Look at the picture on the right. Do you have a house, the front lawn of which gently slopes down to the sidewalk? or slopes quite radically down to the sidewalk. What? Okay. Not gently, all right. A house likes to sit on a level plane. That is, if you were trying to relate your house to your garden, which is the point of this whole lecture, you need to move that plane of the first floor out into the landscape, particularly at the front of the house. The front of the house is your private face showing to the public. And your job is to make the garden at the front of the house welcome people, welcome your family, welcome your guests as they arrive at your home. And one way to do that is to interrupt that slope in order to create what reads like an extension of the first floor of your house. It doesn't have to be on the same level. But what you notice here is that Florence Everts, who is 87 years old, she's still a garden designer in Washington, D.C. And you can't see this part of it. But think about this for your own house. Florence measured the front wall of her two-story house, found that it was 18 feet high, flopped that dimension down, and interrupted the slope of the lawn at the front of her house with a little 18 inch high retaining wall. Then she had a level plane of lawn behind it. She took half of the foundation plants out of 
the front of her house and move them to the remaining slope between that stone wall and this sloping bit down to the sidewalk. And she created a garden. One of the problems with foundation planting is that it is made solely of shrubs. Trees are primary, shrubs are secondary, perennials are tertiary. Any garden has all three, all at once. And so if you're going to do just a perennial border, you know you've got a non-event for five months every winter. There's nothing going on out there. That's not good design. If you get evergreen and deciduous shrubs into that and maybe even some small crab apples that hold their fruit, then you've got something interesting 12 months of the year. All right, the next point here is that Florence has interrupted this slope, but she's put all the plants right where none of us put them, out by the sidewalk. What we do, I flew in here yesterday afternoon, I looked down on 18,491 houses as the plane came in low over Iowa City. I did not see one garden at the front of the house, out by the sidewalk, it's lawn. It is the law that you cannot plant out by the sidewalk. And I would encourage you to think about what Florence has done here. That is to go out by the sidewalk and consider planting a little four, or five, six foot wide bed or a line of crab apples or whatever it might be just to say my house is in a garden as opposed to letting that lawn run straight out. Now this goes right to the heart of how confident you feel as a neighbor because there is neighborly pressure which you maybe want to admit to or won't admit to, but it's there. You should do what everybody else is doing. And so you've got to find your level of comfort in all of this. All right, here's another point about this, like this photograph. All good gardens, all good entrance gardens have lots of prepositions. That is, you step off the sidewalk and onto a new material. You walk through a garden or between two gardens. You walk up a set of steps under the overbranching, overarching branches of the um, dogwoods, between those two dogwoods, along a, set, uh, along a flat walk, up a set of steps, and in the front door. So measure your own entrance garden when you go home against the notion of prepositions. And I think you'll see that every preposition is an experience that helps us slough off the public world of the sidewalk and the streets and enter a private home. So on the right, or on the left rather, is the late Armin Benedict's home in Pound Ridge, New York. Now stand on your driveway in your mind right now and look toward the front of your house. And then let's take a look at what Armin did. First of all, he separates the driveway from the whole front garden. That is, the thing you need to remember is that your driveway is semi-public space. The FedEx guy can drive on it as well as you can. So your job is to put, build in those prepositions, separate the driveway from the privacy of that entrance garden. So what he did is he starts by changing the material from the that of the driveway to that of the walkway to the front door. Cars do not equal people. You've got to change that material. Number two, he's got a break in a stone wall. And you figure that there's probably 25 feet of stone wall to the right of this and 30 feet to the left. And that's only a $10,000 project. What's your next good idea for me? <laughs> so when you look at a picture like this, what you have to say is, I've always wanted a stone wall. I've been saving for five years. I got 10,000 bucks. I'm going to put it along my driveway and put a walkway in it. Or you say, I've got $200 and I think I'll plant a hedge, a shrub hedge to separate my driveway. My point here is don't get caught up in that stone wall. Think he separated his driveway from the front lawn. How could I do that? 
So the next point here is that gateway. We rarely use gates in our gardens in America, and there's this wonderful moment when you open a gate and walk into a space. Think about that. Number four, is the walkway to your front door well lit? Number five, is there a tree overarching the walkway so that you walk under a tree and then out into sunlight? and then under a portico in the house and in the front door. You hear those prepositions? The next point is, is this. Notice that in both these pictures, they have planted either side of the walkway to the front door. Remember I said that the new American garden is walking among your plants. So we rarely plant both sides of the walkway to the front door. We sometimes plant one side, and mostly we don't plant either side. If your job is to welcome guests to your home, plant both sides of the walkway to the front door. All right, the next point is this. Your job is to make sure people go to the door you want them to go to, that they're not knocking at the kitchen door or the, or the uh, whatever other door, a den door. So what, um, what Armin Benedict did here is that he put a portico right over that front door to make sure people knew that was his front door. And then, what, look, see what he did here? He put a big, broad, generous landing by that front door. So that's another point, is that when the front path to your front door arrives at that door, make it bigger. Have it broaden out so you can put pots, a chair, a bench, something that's going to say, welcome to my home. And the other thing Armin did, as a landscape architect, and I asked him about this, I said, Armin, why did you use so many materials in that path to the front door? And he said, oh, those were all left over from jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see the problem? Look at all the materials. It's just way overdone, and he knew it. So if you're going to build a limestone uh, retaining wall, put great big limestone steps to your front door and stay with one material or at most two. All right, here's a, a shot on the right in Hagerstown, Maryland. Will and Sarah Ann Godwin had lawn right up to the sidewalk on the right and then they had uh, used rhododendrons and junipers, the classic threesome, glommed up against the front of their house. So they called me years ago. I was lecturing near there they said, could you come over and help us? So I went over, and what we decided to do was to go right up by the sidewalk. Can you see it? Just, just to the right of the picture. We came in eight feet, and we planted that whole garden with evergreens, deciduous shrubs, uh, perennials. We put a big tree at either end, and then we separated the neighbor's house with just a low group of shrubs and perennials, on both ends of that lawn, and then we planted a shrub and evergreen and perennial garden right along the house. Do you see how that house is now in a garden? Will and Sarah Ann now sit on the front porch of that little house, 24 feet from the sidewalk, and they tell me every single evening, neighbors come and they say, what have you done here? This is wonderful. And little gardens like this are popping up all through their neighborhood in Hagerstown, Maryland, because what people are realizing is that that was no man's land before. You know that part of your house? You know where all of America is doing its gardening is at the back. And we should be gardening down the, the whole front yard, the side gardens, the back gardens, everywhere. But see, all I have to do is wave my, my little pen. But what I'm meaning is that when you start to see your garden as an extension of your house, that it is part of the word home, everything changes. So the other point of this picture on the right is lawn shape. We in America are not paying attention to the lawn shape. We are paying attention to bed shapes, and the lawn comes along for the ride. And it's usually a great big amoeba. Okay. 
willy-nilly, it's just this shape and that curve, and it's a bit of a straight over there and curvy over here. I'm saying that the lawn is the setting for your bed. And if you're just designing bed shapes, and you're not thinking about the lawn, you're not taking advantage of what the lawn can do for your garden to draw its parts together. So you see how that lawn shape draws everything together? And now you look at this shape on the, on the left. This is up in Provincetown, in uh, Cape Cod. There was a curvy path to the front door. There were curvy beds to the right and the left. And what the designer did was to straighten the path uh, you may feel that he overused Methodist Six Hills Giant Catman a little bit, but <laughs> nonetheless, you talk about walking among your plants. This is bushwhacking through your plants. <laughs> the but how interesting, isn't it? And, and you know, just pull it back a little bit. Uh, but notice that the two long pan panels on either side are ellipses. And there's a logic to the shape of the lawn. I'm not saying that you can't use curves in your bed but they should all be related to the curves in your lawn. And here are two examples. All right, the image on the left is the garden I designed for Beverly Dunbar up in Vermont. She had planted, could we focus that one back a little bit on the, on the right, on the left? She had planted the garden between her brick walkway and the garage. You see the garage on the right? And she called me up and said, what do you think I could do? And I said, well, let's measure the width of the path. Take one and a half times that dimension, or it could have been two times that dimension, or its same dimension. And we'll plant four prairie fire crab apples on the left side of that walkway. And then we'll put shrubs and perennials underneath it. And she said, my husband Brad loves his snowblower. There is no way. <laughs> He is not going to destroy every shrub we put in that garden on the left. So I said, okay, let's do all perennials. So we planted a whole June, July, August perennial border, loads and loads of bulbs underneath there. Do you see how welcoming that garden is? And if you put your hand up and take that garden on the left away, you will see that you're walking past the garden instead of through one. So look at what Gail G has done down in Fulton, Maryland. Gail asked me to help her a few years ago. Here's her driveway. Now this brings up a really important point about your car, your driveway, and your front entrance bay. Cars dilute the feeling of intimacy as you arrive at your home. Stand by your own front door tomorrow and look out and see if you see cars going by on the road, see if you see cars parked down in the driveway. If you have a garage, if you have a garage and you have a car, I have a cutting edge idea for you for the design of your entry garden. Get the stuff out of the garage and park your car in it. <laughs> I think there was salt. You know how our garages have become recycling centers? <laughs> get the stuff organized out there and get your car in because these big crony things are diluting that privacy and the grace of your entrance car. Now the other point of this picture on the right, you see that white fence that Gail G put in? She and I talked about how are we going to separate the driveway from the garden? We Americans are so open in the way that we treat our garden. We feel that we, we should have the whole thing on view from the sidewalk or the street. And I'm here to argue that we don't have to do that. You can choose that if you want to, but you don't have to make it all open. So just becoming aware of that, the minute that Gail G put that fence up along that garden, she created right, right in that fence. Can you see the entrance? She's got an entrance to her garden. Now, that's another point about the house that will help you. Where do we most often enter our gardens? By walking down the hallway of the house and stepping out the back door. And there's the whole back garden. What I'm encouraging you to think about is other places that you can enter your garden by walking through a fence, through a gate, 
through something, there's a preposition, into a garden, and that once you get in that garden, you turn around, you don't see cars. They're gone. Now, here's a couple alternatives. The Trimble's garden on the right is in Austin, Texas. What the Trimble's decided to do, and this, this may be more than you want to get into, I don't know, but here's an alternative. They had a landscaper deliver three seven-yard dump truck loads of topsoil right out by the sidewalk, and they raked them out into low birds that have a kind of sweep and a flow to them. And then they planted that whole burn with shrubs and perennials. They're no higher than about four to five feet, so they didn't get all uppity and you can't see my garden. People walking on the sidewalk can still see into the Trimble's yard, but what they did was to separate off that front garden from the sidewalk with that burn. Now you may want to do it with a fence or a shrub, but nonetheless that's what they did. But the same thing the same role that burn plays is that it captures rainwater and holds it in their garden. So it's a drought mitigating design. Now, you see how they shape the lawn? It's a great big curve. Can you see it? It's a uniform 20, 25 foot arc that just sweeps you into the garden and takes you right along the side garden. Or another garden in, in Texas. They put stonework all along the front of the house. Then measured, they measured the front wall of the house. I would have made this deeper. I would have gone out as, at least as far as the house is high. Built a stone wall and then garden six feet out beyond that wall. You see it? So it's a series of lines parallel to the front of the house. Then all that lawn goes out to the street and your neighbors don't feel you're getting up at it. So here's a way to think about your front garden. If you don't want to go all the way out to the sidewalk with your planting, measure the front wall of your house, as these people did in Bennington, Vermont, plot that dimension down and put in a fence. So what you've got is an entrance garden that is in absolute proportion with the front of your house. You come off the two front corners of your house with side fencing, and then every time you put a fence in, you've got a background for a fence on both sides of the fence. So you can plant in front of the fence and behind it. And the result is that you can leave all that lawn out front. But then you've got a level garden. And how do you divide it up? You have a path that leads across the front of the house. And then you have another path that leads right to the front door. So you, do you see how the house is the center of this garden? You see how its proportions and its dimensions drove the design, the doors drove the design of the paths. Notice also that all the windows look into a garden. So when you're in your house, you feel you're in a house in a garden, as opposed to looking out at all that lawn over rhododendrons, junipers, and you. And now you've got a garden that engages. Look what these people on the right did in Eugene, Oregon. They bought a fence, three foot high fence, they set it back three feet from the driveway, or from the sidewalk. So they made a three foot garden for neighbors. Behind it, they've got another three foot garden. Then they've got a long straight panel of lawn, six feet wide, which reads as a, as a path. And then they've loosened up all the foundation plenty by adding perennials in front of the shrubs. And look at how beautiful that is. Now, how do you decide what kind of fence to put in? You look at your house. White trim, white picket. White house, white picket. Or unpainted cedar siding, unpainted cedar fence. So here's what I did for a client up in, in Vermont with all of these ideas. My clients would come home, they would get out of their wagon ear and look at the lack of prepositions. There is one onto a blue stone and into the house, too. And they knew something was wrong because they tied the scarecrow to the trunk of that tree. <laughs> that is, they knew their, their walkway to the front door was not saying, welcome to my home. 
And so they called me up. Now, you look at this picture and you say, okay, right. Who's got 80 feet between their driveway and the front door of their house? Well, these people did. And they also had the wherewithal to do all these stone walls and all this stuff. But the point here is, can you see the prepositions in that walkway? Stepping off the gravel driveway and onto stone, around the corner, under the trees. Notice the stone walls create that feeling of entrance. Look at all the different zones of experience you've had as you walk to that front door. There's a lot going on there. All right, now the question is, oh my, my phone. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. All right, so I'm encouraging you now to think about the side of your house. I mentioned this to a, 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 a group in Detroit a few years ago, and I heard this woman in the audience say, don't make me think about the side garden. It's where I've got my canoe and it's all covered in pine needles. <laughs> what I'm thinking about here is that the garden at the side of your house is the most neglected area of your whole place. So in your mind right now, stand by your side, the two corners, the front corners of your house, and look down the length of it. Do you see bulkheads, electric meter boxes, air conditioning units, propane tanks? You know how we put all our utilities down the side of the house? Do you see any destination for people to sit in a garden along the side of the house. That's another rule that you're not allowed to do, is ever sit on the side of your house. The side gardens are basically for your dog as it goes from the front to the back. <laughs> and there's a worn lawn path there. All right, now in your mind, walk all the way to the back of your house and turn around and look toward, uh, look down the length of the sides of your house, out toward the street or sidewalk or whatever it might be. Do you see cars going by? Do you see cars parked in a driveway? Do you see all these utilities going on? It's time to start addressing that. So what I did here for my clients is that I ran a path all the way to the front door, but then I had an auxiliary path, a secondary path, that comes along the side of the house. Ask yourself if you can run a path across the whole front of your house that you could garden both sides of and that that leads to paths going down the sides of the house. All right, so here's what I did. I measured the height of this wall, flopped that dimension down. That showed me where to put that wall. If any of you have screen porches, that is the place for fragrance gardening. That is, when you sit in a screen porch and you've got all that wonderful fragrance gathered around you, you feel engaged in that garden. Another point here, Tim Smith, the architect, knew that a north-facing screen porch is in shade far more than it's ever in sun, and so he put skylights in there to get direct sunlight down into that, into those screen porches. That's maybe not something you want to do given the heat out here, but it's just a thought. All right, now remember I said we give the whole story away uh, from the driveway and really from the front seat of our cars as we arrive home from a day of work and we can see 80% of the garden. Consider the possibility that you might put a fence or a hedge and a gate off the front corner of your house or the back corner of your house so that when you pull into your driveway, you don't see the back garden. What do you want to do when you see that gate? You want to open it. and You know there's something interesting back there. And so gates, and doorways, and fences create mystery. They create a separation. They create thresholds. They create that feeling of, I wonder what's back there. And that's good design. All right, another way to think about your house here is the wings of the house. That is, here is Susie Russell's kitchen. Think about your own kitchen now. 
and the door that leads outside from your kitchen. What Susie did is say, I would love to have guests over for lunch and we could sit right outside my kitchen door. And so she designed herself this brick patio. Think about how you might create a sitting area that reads and acts as an extension of your kitchen. Then she said, it's pretty hot out there at midday because I get the sun pouring right down on me. So she said, I'll build that trellis. But notice how she built the trellis exactly the same width as the kitchen wing of her house. Then she measures the height of that wall, and that's how far out that trellis, that arbor comes from the kitchen wing. And so the whole garden is in proportion. Now look, here's the walkway to her front door. She is six, eight feet from her walkway to the front door, and she's out there having lunch with her friends. That is unheard of in the annals of American garden history. <laughs> and it's good design, because people come walking up that path between those balls of you. They see that table, and that idea is planted in their head. Maybe we're going to have lunch outside. Or on this garden on the left, um, I, the, when I designed this sitting area, I measured the height of that wall, flopped that dimension down. That's where that retaining wall went. Because it's a brick house, we just ran two straight lines here and there. And since then, um, they have gardened all around all sides of this with shrubs, perennials, and small trees. And now the Belsers sit on a patio in a garden. And that, is, that whole thing reads as an extension of that room. Can you see it? This is a very new way of thinking, very old-fashioned way. But a new way for Americans' curvy bed mad design is that you extend those rooms and their roles in your house out into the garden. And then your garden makes your house feel intimate and warm and welcoming. It's a very big deal. If you've got in the picture on the left here, this is again how you look at these pictures. Do any of you have a deck or a stone patio off the south or west sides of your house that is so hot in July and August that you have to wait for the sun to go down before you can go out there? The picture on the left has got an idea for you. That is to cover a third, half, or all of that patio or deck with an arbor up which you send a beautiful rose that will clamber over it, or a wisteria, or whatever. Keep in mind that people are sun lovers and shade lovers. They're, we're divided in half. And if you're going to have guests over to see your garden, you've got to provide for both of those. And so here is for the shade lovers. The picture on the right is simply, don't forget the sides of your garage, the sides of a barn, the sides of a shed, to help you find ways to support trellises, to soften all those buildings. Notice what happened here is they measured the height of that wall, flopped that dimension down. That helped them see where to put a boxwood hedge. And the minute you put that boxwood hedge and that path in there, you know where to put those plants. Instead of at the perimeter of the lawn, you get people walking among those plants. All right, here's what I did for Sally Seymour in Dummerston, Vermont. Think about your own side of your house now. Here's Sally's sitting room, 36 feet long. Then Sally's kitchen, which is 18 feet long. And then Sally's garage out of the frame, 24 feet long. The 24-foot-long garage supported a 24-foot-long herb garden. The kitchen supported a 16-foot-wide dining area, an extension of the kitchen. And that garden, the, the bulk of the picture, is right outside her living room. So all winter long, she sees evergreen shrubs. She sees all summer long all these flowers blooming right outside her sitting room window. That's a big deal. It makes that room totally different. Now, here's the side of the house um, 
here's where I'm, here's the side of your house. And what I'm encouraging you to think about is separating off your front lawn from your side garden with a fence, with a hedge, with a peony bed, with a little boxwood hedge, whatever it might be that's going to work for you, with a gate in it, and the minute you do that and you separate this off from your neighbor that's only 36 feet away from you with a fence, then you can create a destination, a bench. We are not using benches enough in our gardens. We are, as garden designers, we are making places for people. Did you hear that? We are making places for people. And the minute you understand that your role as a garden designer is to make places for people, that whole issue of where do I put these plants that I just bought at the nursery because yet again I couldn't help myself. <laughs> you say to yourself, is this a fragrant plant I just bought at the nursery and I don't know where to put it? If you know where people sit, that's where you put that fragrant plant, right next to where people sit. So here's turning that useless side garden into something really interesting. And many of you, and this is what I saw looking down from the air yesterday, have trees all around your houses because of the wind here and, and the heat of the summer. Make a woodland garden off the side of your house. High prune those trees so that you can see out from all those second and first story windows, but don't prune all the branches along the boundary. You following me? You high prune all these branches so all of the windows of your house look into a woodland garden, but you leave all the lower branches here so you don't see your neighbor. And then you've got the bones of a woodland garden. You see how this is a lecture on the 20-year projects? All right, coming around to the back of the house now. What I'm encouraging you here to do is to think, how can I draw people? Let me, let me start this again. The key to a good garden design is itinerary. It's path leading to path. And when you get people to your side door, as I did with Stan Fry's garden in Peterborough, New Hampshire, I planted this seed, here's the way to the back. And you see it, and you come around the back. Now you look at this next picture, and this looks pretty formal, but it's a formal house. But what Stan and Sherry Fry were doing is sitting out here of a summer evening and that blue stone had only been collecting heat, had been collecting heat from the sun all day long. It was about 106 degrees on that blue stone by, by July 15th, and it was until September 1. So we came up with this idea of a trellis work over the top of that. Now, if you've got a rural home way out in, in a little village in, in, in Iowa, this makes no sense whatsoever. But there's the idea of trellis work over stone patios. That's the key to this idea. And you make it work however you want. But the minute you get wisteria or whatever coming up over that, do you see how we have made a place for people that's hospitable, that's cool, that's welcoming? And notice that we use squares, not diamonds, in that trellis. I think squares are far better than diamonds when it comes to any trellis work. All right, and then Stan said, could you design me a garden outside? Now, I'm not showing you this picture by way of seeing, saying, see how great I am as a designer of formal gardens. What I'm saying is formal house, formal gardens, informal house, informal garden. Size your own house up. Decide what you like as a person and make a garden, but make sure it extends the life of your house into a garden in a, in a really interesting way. Can we focus that one, Beth, on the right a little bit? All right, this is for those of you who have island beds. Island beds were big in the 60s and 70s. You know those kidney-shaped beds out in the middle of the lawn? They, they appeared in, in all sorts of gardens across America. So I had a gentleman come to me and he said, I have 
a rose garden, an herb garden, an ornamental grass garden, a blueberry patch, a raspberry garden. This is my vegetable plant pot. He said, I think I've got a problem. My garden isn't holding together. And I agreed with him. And so do you, now, now here's a point about this picture on the left. Can you make a, a mental map of the lawn of the picture on the left? Can you see that map of the lawn? Do you see how it's a curvy edge doily with nine holes in it? <laughs> you see it? All right, now look at the map of the lawn on the right. Can you see the clarity of shape of the lawn on the right and the lack of clarity of shape on the lawn on the left? So this is what I encourage Bill to do. And again, all I had to do was do my little pointer, but what Bill had to do was dig up every one of those beds. And he put a grass here and here and here and there and there and there and there. He put a blueberry bush here and here, here and there. He took up the lawn between them and put stepping stones down if he still wanted passageway between those beds. And then the herbs are spread throughout, the roses are spread throughout. He's now got a big idea operating. This lawn is eight feet wide, that's 16 feet, and that's eight feet. One of the most important things you've got at home when it comes to garden design is a tape measure. And we're not using them as we develop our gardens in America. We're not using tape measures. But remember I said that we are making places for people and that itinerary is the key to good garden design. Here you are standing on your back steps of your house, right in this picture. Can you see yourself standing right there? Your back door is to your back. You're looking out into your front, into your back lawn. Do you see how you can break into that lawn? By creating those two long snakes of beds that have a uniformly shaped lawn between them. But here's where you could start, is that arbor right there a rustic black locust arbor. Does Robinia pseudoacacia grow here, black locust trees? Black locust does? The old timers in Vermont say black locust in the ground lasts one day longer than a rock. <laughs> so cut down a couple of black locust trees um, on your place or somebody who's got a whole bunch of them and put four of them in the ground and make a grape arbor way at the back of your house. Now look at the relationship between house and garden. You see it? You step out your back door and instead of seeing all that lawn with a few perennials around the edge, there's a place to sit. And that gets people out into, out into that perimeter and gets them moving around in it. Now here's the other thing. Can you imagine standing at the front corner of this house and seeing all that distance, that makes a little garden feel huge. Rosemary Veery said, take advantage of your longest vista. Can we focus that one on the right? All right, so here's what Mary and I did. Mary, is, as I told you, is from the Cotswolds in England. 1995, we bought this little cottage. This is what we saw when we bought our cottage in 1995, the perimeter garden. Can you see it? It's a teeny garden. You could fit eight of our garden in this room. Can you see what I mean by perimeter garden? All the plants are at the edge of the lawn. So we would walk out of our French doors, walk around the perimeter of the garden, walk back into the house and say, well, what was that all about? <laughs> As opposed to making places for people. So you see what we did with that space on the right? We took the lawn up. It took us about an hour to get that lawn up. We had somebody build us a little low retaining wall. It's about 12 inches high. And you see how now we are living among our plants. It's so wonderful. Now, if this looks, it's too small for you, what you could do is put a, let's say this is the back of your house. You could put a fence here and there and there. That fence marking out 
almost exactly the back wall of your house. Just flop it onto the ground, put a fence in, and you could do that same thing. I don't think Mary and I have got more than $2,000 into that garden. We did all the planting ourselves. That robinia tree was there. And look at how that is an extension. Our little cottage is about 1,400 square feet. That is like another room in our house. And in fact, guests, we rent the cottage out by the week. And guests tell us that they spend more time in that little garden, at that little table, than they do sometimes in the house. All right, here's what I mean by shaping lawn. This is at Swarthmore College at the, at the uh, Scott Arboretum. And this is a model for you. If you look at that picture on the right, if you've got only 30 feet of lawn between the back of your house and the back of your property, take this as a model. Now, don't get caught up with this $28,000 pergola at the back here. Just think, I could have a little bit of stonework around the edge of a panel of lawn in the middle. I could plant a little row of crab apples here and here and underplant them with daylilies. I could put a simple grape arbor with a simple little bench instead of my $3,000 luchins bench here, put a couple pots either side of it, and I've really got a garden at the back of my house. But do you see how the whole idea is coming off that door? That is, when you get home, walk around the whole first floor of your house and look at your doors and divide them into primary, secondary, and tertiary. Then go upstairs and down looking at every window primary, secondary, tertiary windows. The laundry room window doesn't matter really at all. There is, however, one window that means a lot, particularly to those of you who are mothers of young children, and you know what window that is. It's the window over the kitchen sink. And that's a major vantage point. All right, the L of the house, where a wing meets another wing at a right angle or where the garage meets the house. Rather than follow the line of the house with foundation planting, continue this wall of the house that way, continue the front wall of the garage this way, and have those two meet. And do you see how that's an entrance garden that wraps its arms around you, that says, welcome to my home? Now you look at that brick wall and you do a quick calculation and it's only $26,000. And so you think, well, I don't want to do that. But I could put a picket fence in that would only be $800. And my husband or my spouse is a great carpenter. We might be able to do it for 200. We just buy the materials and make it ourselves. Or it could be a hedge or whatever it might be. But do you see how that becomes well, let me back off. The, the most difficult thing for a garden designer is to find edges for new gardens. Where should the edge of my new garden go? And the L of a house shows you. Do you see that the drawing on the right is of the garden on the left? It's the same garden. So there's a model for you. Every one of the pictures in this lecture, well, I think 80% of them are, are in my book. Now, one of the first things I do, being a garden designer in Vermont, is I look at what the roofing material is of my client's home. When I see standing seam roof, and when I see slate, I know that every time there's a snowstorm, that snow is going to come crashing down onto those shrubs. That you can go out to, in the next week or two, I think, maybe the next three weeks, where you could sit in that corner of the L of your house, but there's nowhere else on your, around your house you could sit because it's still too cold. This is what Berta Atwater did. She designed a garden that looks beautiful all winter and summer, and she put the edges of it parallel with this wall of the house and this wall of the house. And you see how she put the palm of her hand in ilex hillerine? That's the, the palm of her, of her hand which she shears. I think one of the key elements in her uh, garden maintenance bucket is nail clippers. <laughs> this is one serious maintained garden. But notice how beautiful that garden would look in the dead of winter. 
I design every garden by starting with the paths, and number two, I design the winter garden. Then I go to the spring and summer and fall gardens. But if you get the winter garden right, you've got framework, you've got structure, you've got evergreens in balance with deciduous, then you do your flower garden. There it is. We've got one slide that uh, latches on to itself here. Let me just show you this picture on the left. Pergolas are wonderful things to sit under. My clients had a little two-foot inset here and a six-foot inset here and 12 feet between them. I slid that pergola right into that slot like it was there all along. Can you see the inevitability of that? You know what this lecture is about? Making gardens that feel, yes, that making gardens that feel inevitable. Making gardens that feel just right in relation to your house. That's the trick that straight edged beds offer you. They are so easy to build on. Curvy beds are so difficult to build on. Once they're in, you just don't know where to go next. So here is the late Thomas Church's garden out in San Francisco, and that's his kitchen window. Now, when I was out there interviewing Mrs. Church in 1993, this was in fact her kitchen window, and she, we stood there and we looked out. Look at that beautiful little garden. Boxwood, Clivius in pots, and a little cafe table and chairs, the end. But the minute you're inside looking out into that, you feel, you, you, you emotionally and intellectually inhabit that space when you're in the house. You're in that place in your mind. And that's what we are not doing enough of in our American gardens today. All right, spaces between buildings. I have about 10 more minutes here. Spaces between buildings. This is Karen Brine's house on the Connecticut River in Lyme, New Hampshire, and this is her garage. Do any of you, do you have detached garages out here? Yeah? All right, the space between is a very important space. The Japanese regard the space between buildings as as important as the volumes of the buildings themselves. Don't think that the space between your house and your garage or garden shed or the space between a garden shed and the barn is a void. It is a volume. You with me? It is a place. And if you start drawing relationships between the corners or ends of barns and garden sheds with fences, with alleys, with orchards, the relationships begin to come together. Garden design is the relationship of the part to the whole. Your job is to draw all those parts into a relationship with one another. So when she had this, when, when uh, Karen Bryan had this pergola built to build a relationship between house and garage, look what else she got, a garden entrance. And so you could do that wherever you've got two buildings on your property. Here's what I did for Diane Kelly up in Vermont. People would park here, and they had a 75, 80-foot walk to the front door. Nobody ever knew where to go. And Diane basically asked me to solve that problem with the garden. So what we did is that I put this light here to say this is where you come when guests were coming for dinner. Then we put this fence in and ran it right to a stone uh, uh, chimney. We came eight feet off the, this wall, which is basically that dimension. Because marble is quarried in Dorset, Vermont, and still is, we used marble squares two feet, and look at that magic carpet that just sweeps people to the front door. There's no question where they're meant to go. For the Petersons in Peterborough, New Hampshire, I did something even simpler. We ran a fence from the corner of the garage to the corner of the house and created a whole little intimate entrance garden. It's as simple as could be. 
We put clematis paniculata all along this, you know, the fall blooming clematis? So that's covered in white little tiny blossoms in the fall. We then came to the front door with a panel of bluestone and then shifted to stepping stones to the rubbish bins in the back of the garage and then stepping stones to the swimming pool. But just that alone creates that wonderful feeling of walking within an entrance garden. All right, these are two pictures. The house is on the left, the garage is on the right. Can you see it in both of these pictures? And the left, the garage is offset from the front of the house by about eight feet. Whereas in the picture on the right, they're parallel with one another. So what I'm, oh, I'm sorry, the doors, I'm, I'm sorry, they're both offset. It's the doors that are right across from one another. Now, here's the challenge for you. This is a tough thing for us Americans to do. Plant a hedge here and there to make a place between the house and the garage for somebody other than the dog and to create that same kind of pergola or arbor as Karen Bryan did to draw a sound relationship between the two. If the garage door and the kitchen door are at bleak angles from one another, that forces you into sort of an informal garden. If they're right across from one another, it might build a formal garden. All right, now little buildings and the space between a little building and a house. Angelic. And that is, in fact, her name, Angelic. Um, you see what her mother was about there. Uh, uh, here is the little building. Can you see the drawing on the right is of the garden on the left? All right. Angelic's husband is a builder. He bought a 12 by 16 foot derelict chicken coop. And he rebuilt it into Anne's garden shed. And she came, asked me to come down and help her. She said, where should I put the chicken house, chicken house slash garden shed? I said, let's put it right off the front door to create a bookend with the house and the garden. That gave us an axis, a straight line, central axis to work from. Then we put a fence here and here. Here's our front door. We've got a gate here. Can you see the gate up in here? Now people walk in here to the front door. But look what they come into, this wonderful, rich experience. Here's the Chop Tank River out there. This is on the eastern shore of Maryland. And that whole Chop Tank River is sitting on top of that yew hedge, because she doesn't have deer. Uh, here's what they do. Have any of you been to Colonial Williamsburg? There is no better place in America to go to learn how to relate little buildings to one another than Colonial Williamsburg. It is so beautiful there, you want to weep. We have so lost our way with domestic architecture. But here we are. Look at the circle and the square between your house and garage. What a beautiful, simple model. Here's your garage. Here's the side door of your house. You do a little fence here, a little U hedge back there. If you don't have deer, if it's boxwood, then the deer can, won't eat it. And you do a little something like that, the circle and the square. I'm showing you this by way of saying, don't forget the alley or the orchard as a way to draw relationships along and across good big distances. This is in Salt Lake City at Victoria Jane Reams Garden. Uh, and you get way down at the other end, turn around, and you look down this alley at paper bark maples. They'll do all right here, won't they, paper bark maples? She's got all of them covered with little, little lights. She's got a whole garden here. There are six air conditioning units within 12 feet of that path, and you'd never know they were there. You turn around down at this end, and you look down that full length right up to the, uh, the mountain that Alta Ski Range is on. You know Alta? She's carved a 20-foot window in her white pine trees to open that view up. It's really something else. Now, little buildings. I want to close in five minutes. I want to close with little buildings in the landscape. This is our garden up in Westminster, West Vermont, population 800. My wife teaches in the two-room schoolhouse in the village. There are about eight of them left in Vermont. 
And the Randy family came to this property in 1760 because they had lived in Woodbury, Connecticut. And Woodbury, Connecticut in 1760 was getting too built up for them. So they moved to Vermont. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it's a great story. And they cleared hundreds of acres of land. The 12th generation of Rannies was just born about three weeks ago. They are still there since 1760, still raising Jersey cows. And we bought the house that, that Harold Rannies' ancestors had built. It's right behind here. But this is the shed, or rather a gazebo, that we built on our house. Don't forget that these little gazebos that you've got frame views in four directions. This is looking north into our garden. This picture is looking south into a meadow. Now, if any of you have prairie, if you have meadows or wildflower meadows or anything, get mown paths out into them and a bench at the end of a straight mown path. Uh, we actually framed a beautiful view of a telephone pole, we realized. And so we planted a birch tree right there. But these mown paths say, my prairie, my meadow, is a part of my garden. If you've got woodland, do the same thing. You know where that little bit of woodland at the back of your house meets lawn? You may as well put a 20-foot fence up for all the invitation. That line says. That is, you've got to break into that woodland with paths, get people walking in among those trees, get them into those woods, plant hostas if you don't have deer, and plant ferns if you do. Now, this is on the right, is on the left, rather, is looking out into our meadow to a lawn path that we have mowed under three pin oaks with a bench under it. That, by the way, is 20 acres of dandelion in full seed 28 feet from our garden. <laughs> that was a scary, scary June. This is our, we've asked Harold to mow just a little earlier. Uh, and this is our view looking west. All right, so what I want to say in these last few slides is that your little buildings, your garage, your garden shed, just like the house, can give rise to beautiful little gardens around them if you pay attention to proportion and dimension and style. This is our garden shed. This is listing 18 degrees to port uh, because the previous, when the, this garden shed was built 110 years ago, the foundation was four nail kegs filled with cement <laughs> and then put in the ground. So they all moved. But what I did was measure the height of that wall, quadrupled it, planted an arborvitae hedge, and that became a background for a geranium peony bed. We measured the height of that wall, flopped that down, and that's where we put the two hedges either side. You see how we made a whole garden by just measuring that little building. Here's that hedge. Can you see that height? Flop it down. There's the, the hedge. And I'd like to uh, just quickly show you Stan Fry, a client, asked me to design a little herb garden off the back of his garage. You could do the same thing. A lovely little simple garden off the back of your garage, parallel with this. Then Stan said to me, what are we going to do between the garage and the, and the barn? And I said, well, let's put some retaining walls in. Again, I know this is a big deal. Stan Fry developed a digital camera. He can do about whatever he wants in his garden. But but my point here is seeing the relationship between those little buildings. And then you can build on these straight lines uh, just as Stan has done. And I'll show you these as the last two slides. You see how, how there was the line before and Stan came out another eight or 10 feet and built another garden in there. Stan's got 11 acres working on 17 now, something like this. So my point in this lecture for you is that if you pay attention to your house and if you try out the idea of straight lines as you make places for people, I think that you'll gain a lot of confidence as a garden designer, but you will also create a garden that feels inevitable. Thanks very much.
Well, we're going to get started with questions now. Isn't this great? This is sure fun. Um, I had somebody tell me today they learned more from your lecture than they have ever learned from any gardening lecture they've gone to before, and they've been Whoa. around. They've been Thank around. you. Gord, over the past month on the Garden Web Landscape Design Forum, there has been a lot of discussion about the meaning of your statement, quote, perimeter gardens do not engage, unquote. Could you please expand upon this concept? Thanks. Well, before I answer that, I would like to say what a pleasure it's been to be here and to lecture to you uh, for the last hour and 20 minutes or so. Uh, when lecturers stand before audiences, in about the first 10 minutes, you can tell whether they're with you or not. And it was <laughs> very obvious that, that you were with me on this. So thank you very much for your attention and your obvious interest. Um, well, I'm, I'm interested in this question because the, the perimeter garden, I think, solves a lot of problems for many of us. That is, when you're looking for those places to put plants, you put them out at the edges, either the edge of the house or the edge of the, of the garage or the edge of the lawn, or you put a, a little gazebo out in the lawn and then you put impatience around them. <laughs> and so we're all, we're looking for places. We can't help ourselves with these plants that are so seductive. And all I'm, encouraging you to think about in getting beyond perimeter gardening is that if you, if you start every idea you have for a new garden bed with the idea that you're making a place for people to visit, to be engaged in that experience of walking into an herb garden rather than past an herb garden, if you create a perennial garden, for example, that has a bench in it. I mean, that's one of the first things Mary and I did. We put in two perennial borders, 90 feet long, 12 feet wide. Now we have to maintain this thing. <laughs> <laughs> but at the very top of it, our son Nathaniel said, Dad, let's make a sitting area up here. He was 12 at the time. And he said, we could have a couple steps up because there's a little bit of a grade there. And then we could put stone right in the top of the perennial garden. And then we could put chairs and, or a bench and tables. We could have a few pots up in there. And that's, in fact, what we did. So the difference between perimeter gardening and this idea that I'm encouraging you to think about is that you sit and walk among your plants. You feel in a garden rather than walking past one. So I hope that answers the question. Good. When there is a, a hard maple in the center of a front lawn, now this person means not necessarily centered exactly in the whole lawn, but mm -hmm. equal distances on either side. It is only three and a half feet from the front sidewalk with a gentle slope. What do, you, what do you suggest for landscaping this area? How do you work around this tree? What's the distance between that tree and the front of the house? 15 feet. 15 feet. Is it a one-story house or two? Two-story two house. Uh-huh. Right. Now, do you have a diff as difficult a time as we have gardening under a maple tree? Because 90% of their roots are in the top three feet. Of Mm-hmm. All the kinds. Mm -hmm. Yesterday. Right. So, so no, there won't be much. <clears throat> right. And I suspect, given the diameter of that tree, that those roots are right up to the foundation of your house. Um, no, oh, no. Oh, no. They're not? Well, I don't know. I would, yeah. I would the roots of any tree <clears throat> are one and a half times the distance from the trunk to the drip line, one and a half times. So I bet they're right up to that house. Is it sloping? Is it sloping coming down? Right. 
All right, well, let's say that you've got a two-story house and you've only got maybe 15 or 18 feet between the house and the tree, am I right? Eight, 18 feet or so. One way to do it is to incorporate that tree right into uh, a, an entrance garden. So let's say you don't want to build a retaining wall to level that lawn because you'll kill the maple. And then if you put any soil on top of a root system of a maple, you're going to do it in. So what you might consider doing is coming down either, do you have a deer problem? No. No. All right, maybe what you do is you come off either side, either corner of the front of your house with a yew hedge or a boxwood hedge or a fence or something that's going to claim a space out there. And you come down and then you come across and you either come in front of that tree with that hedge, or you do this and then do a little semicircle so that that tree relates to the street, or th is there a sidewalk? A sidewalk. All right, so that tree relates to the sidewalk. And then inside that, over time, you work your way down that hill. Now, is it a, would you call it a shade garden inside that space? It's very sunny. Even as big as that tree is, there's... Right, yeah, right here. Yeah. The tree right now is in the <coughs> uh, If you don't have a deer problem, then maybe a lot of uh, hostas is a classic that's going to make it underneath a maple tree. But they're the yellow leaf forms and the variegated forms that will take a lot of sun, like sun power uh, or uh, hosta summon substance. But daylilies are going to compete with the root systems of that maple. So what I'm getting at is that you find plants, both shrubs and perennials, uh, and maybe even understory trees, like, this, like Amelanchier canadensis. How's serviceberry going to do for you? Maybe Amelanchier. And you gradually start up by the house and build on your successes as you move in a straight line toward that tree and the fence or hedge. Now, the other way to do this is to build the hedge or the fence with the garden as you move down, because that's a lot of space to all of a sudden make a new garden in. So maybe you divide it up into three areas, three one-year projects, and you bring those hedges and fences down or whatever you're going to do and decide whether you're going to do this or go out to the sidewalk and come across and turn that whole area into a garden with paths and you start the design for this with stepping stone paths that are going to go through that space. And then if some of the plants down by the, by the sidewalk are four or five <coughs> feet tall, they might even provide enough privacy that you could get a bench or a couple chairs out front there, just like the, the people did in Hagerstown, Maryland. They can sit right in their front garden. Does that help at all? <coughs> Idea. Another idea. Yeah, yeah. Those big maples are a problem. How do you how do you garden under them? Yeah, yeah. There's they have a couple questions about measuring. Uh, when measuring the height of a house, do you go to the full roof line or just up to the eaves? All right. So this idea of measuring to to acknowledge the dimensions of the house. Um, is, is a good place to start, but don't get slavish and, and get all sort of tight with these dimensions because sometimes they're going to work and sometimes they aren't. But what I would do on the eave side of a house is I would measure the height of the wall until it meets the roof overhang. And I would start there. I'd flop that dimension down. And you can do this with cardboard boxes. Uh, literally just set a bunch of cardboard boxes out at that edge and see how it feels. Let's say you're going to build a fence there. Or you just push bamboo stakes into the ground and tie that bright forester's tape on it, you know, the yellow or the red or the luminescent pink tape to it, and just sort of mock up the garden at one times the height, then two times the height, three times the height. Um, if this is all about the golden mean, you know, you sort of can go to palladio.com or the goldenmean.com and find all this. But 
The point is to never go less than, if you can, never go less than the height of that adjacent wall. You can always go further. Um, so that's one. Now, when you're on a gable end, where you're looking at, at the triangle at the gable end of a house, I would start with two measurements. I'd, I'd start just by going from the foundation up to the roof overhang, and then I'd measure all the way up to the peak, flop those dimensions down. And when you get a larger dimension, like 24 feet to the, to the peak of the gable end, what you might do is go one and a half. So you go 24 plus 12, so you go out 36 feet. And try that, but try all of these. And then you run into <coughs> realistic problems like the maple tree. It's right smack out there in the middle of everything. And so you have to adjust and you know, make it. But at least this gives you a start and a kind of level of confidence about how to break into all that lawn out there. And by the way, I'd like to add <coughs> one point. Chuck, <coughs> Chuck came up to me um, after, and he, and he said to me, uh, I think I've done everything wrong in my garden. <laughs> and he described to me that his garden, which is what we saw on our way here, right, mm -hmm. has no lawn at all. It's all garden. And so all this discussion that I had just doesn't matter. That is, if you're going to completely surround your house with a garden, all this business of lines and proportion and dimension just doesn't come into play. Because nobody's going to be aware of the stepping stone paths that curve and work through your gardens. This is a lecture about 99% of us who have lawn in our gardens. And it's how to work with the lines of house, lines of beds, and lines of lawn that most of us are dealing with. And then there are people like Chuck and his wife, Ann, who have gone way beyond most of us <laughs> into <laughs> totally surrounding their house with a garden. And that's when none of this really matters. It's wonderful. <laughs> Great. This person uh, says, our house slopes down to, gol to a golf course. We want our yard to utilize the view and don't want to break it up with a fence. Any suggestions? If it slopes down to the, to the golf course, um, is it the back of the house? Yes. It's the back of the house. If you... It's a beautiful I bet. And it doesn't sound like you want to do anything. Are there any trees between you and the golf course? Trees that we've planted that are... That you've high pruned so you can see through? Do you sit out there? Is there a sitting area? A couple buckets and a big tree look out. Uh-huh. And is it, is it level out a distance? A little bit. How far? 50 feet, maybe. 50 feet. Oh, you're all set, it sounds to me. I mean, when you've got a beautiful view like that, and this is a really important point about garden design, is that if you've got to know when not to plant as well as when to plant. <laughs> and if you've got a beautiful view of a golf course and all those beautiful rolling green um, fairways and tees and everything, what I would do is just to make sure that if you've got a big view, you provide little places for people to look at it. People like to be in little places to see big views. And you've got it in your, in your screen porch. The other thing is that you, yeah. The other thing about a big view, and this could be true of some of you in this audience, if you've got these big Iowa skies, these enormous, enormous views, to make sure that you plant something between, plant trees between you and that view. Because what can often happen, I see this more in, in oceanside houses in the, north, in the northeast. A big view of the ocean, or out here, a big prairie or a meadow or whatever, if you've got nothing between the house and that view, that view can tend to do this. It comes up and goes flat on you. It almost reads like a vertical rather than a horizontal view, and it loses life. 
But if you plant 10 or 15 trees between your house and that view, the uprights of every one of those trees frames views. The branches that come out frame another view. It's just like a painting. You need a frame around it, just like a camera lens. You need your, you, it does sound it. Yep. So if you say you need a small, you need to view it, a big view from a small area, are you talking about just a small bench, or are you saying you should enclose that area to make well, it I would feel enclose more small? That. I would make it feel small. By plantings. Yeah. I mean, you think, you see, one of the, if I say gardens are for people, what I'm also about is that, is that your garden needs to provide a rich variety of emotional experiences. And if, for example, the sky is the roof over 90% of your garden, you are not varying the emotional experience that comes from things overhead. If all the garden is open, you're not taking advantage of how people feel when they come into a narrow space and then walk it out into a broad space. Somebody went through our garden and said they felt seven different temperatures. And what they were realizing is that they were going from sun to shade to filtered shade to sun to under a gazebo, out into full sun under an apple tree, out into the lawn. Do you see what I mean? And every one of those experiences. So if you make gardens for people, what you're thinking about, yes, is the plants that we can't resist, but more than anything, it's the emotional response that people have to the way you've laid out those plants. And that means it's, it's, the, it's all this stuff I've been talking about. It's, it's the structure, it's paths and layout that can help you. You know what's a good model for this whole idea? And that is a novel. So if you think of the latest novel that you've read, a novel has got a main character that goes through, let's say, 18 chapters of a book. Every one of those chapters has a different pace, has a different setting, has a different cast of characters, and yet the main character is the path through your garden. And every part of your garden is a different chapter in that book. And that every experience that you provide your guests and your visitors and your family is a different chapter. It has a different rhythm, it has a different role, it has a different mood, and the path links all of those together, yet each and each of them as separate units all combine to create one idea. And you don't want to get all fussy and, you know, create all these disparate ideas, but what you do want to do is to say to yourself, just like when you're cooking dinner for guests, and here is one of the masters of Ohio, Iowa who knows how to cook dinner for guests, um, is that you don't say, I'm going to have a Thai appetizer, I'm going to have um, filet mignon, and then we're going to have apple pie with ice cream. Uh, you might, but if you're a chef uh, uh, of uh, Bruce, Bruce's quality, you think, I'm going to have a Thai dinner, or I'm going to have uh, an American beef-centered dinner, or I'm going to have a New England dinner. That's how you think about your garden. And you let the house give you that big idea. When you are measuring, do you actually measure the wall of the house? And if so, how do you physically go about it? I do measure the wall of the house. And I use a, a tape measure that will pretty much behave I have yet to meet a tape measure that will properly behave, but you know how they want to sort of flip back on you. But I'll just shoot a, a tape measure up as fast as I can, or I'll get a ladder out. But um, when it comes to getting to that gable end, I'm not going to necessarily climb a ladder and get too, too nervous about the exact dimension. Uh, this may also make Bruce nervous, because he's not a man who would let a detail like that go. <laughs> but, <laughs> but some of us need to measure that exact height, and that's fine too. 
But what I'm, what I'm trying to get, uh, well, what I can see is, is the relationship of, tri of a triangle to a rectangle, and I can estimate, or I can count up clabbards, because I know how many clabbards there are. So you don't have to put your life in your hands in order to get your garden right. But um, that's, that's so, one way to okay. do it. The other way to do it is to get upstairs in the second floor window, open the window, drop a tape measure down, and then shoot it up to the gable end. OK, that's good. What is do that you OK, Bruce? <laughs> yeah. What do you do if your walk is, if your si or if your driveway is the walk to your house? You're talking about driveways and, and Right, well, walks. if the driveway to, material is the walk to your house, I would turn, and this is exactly what Mary and I had to do in our little cottage in England, is our driveway goes right up to the foundation of our house, and it's pots that make all the difference. That is, that what we have done is to buy a lot of frost-free pots for our cottage in England, and we leave them out all winter because you can there. Can you leave any pots out here? All right, maybe they are pots that are made of fiberglass. And when you backfill them, don't do any backfilling, and this is all I ever use in pots, is what we call promix in the Northeast. It's, it's perlite, vermiculite, peat moss, and fertilizer. Don't put any soil into these pots. And also, you can put shipping peanuts in with it or old tennis balls. And if you're really nervous about terracotta pots snapping during the winter, then buy fiberglass pots for the winter. And what um, a lot of people do in the Northeast is they'll get branches <coughs> of spruce or Korean fir or white pines and then red stems of, of, of dogwood, red twig dogwoods, and put those into that, into that um, um, back filling that you put in the pot. And that carries you through the winter. And then, do you plant your annuals around Memorial Day here or a little earlier? A little earlier now. A little earlier? Yeah, then during the summer, just make a whole garden out of pots. Sydney Edison from Middletown, Connecticut, or from Newtown, Connecticut, has just written a book called Gardens, oh, can he remember? I think it's Gardens to Go, but it's a book about gardening only in pots. Take a look at that. Um, Google uh, Sydney, S-I-D-N-E-Y, Edison, E-D-D-I-S-O-N. But it's container gardening. And you can do so much with containers. Just don't plant annuals that require a huge amount of maintenance. Like those Argoranthemums, as beautiful as Chelsea Girl is, if you're not out there every day, the thing looks awful. If you have a garden that with straight lines, that is outlined with straight lines, can you still then use a wandering path Absolutely. through that? Absolutely. So you can yep. mix that is that the, the, it's You've got to think about primary, secondary, and tertiary all the time. Uh, <clears throat> but if the primary shape is established by a hedge or a fence, then the secondary shape, that is the path as it works through the garden, can do pretty much whatever it wants, particularly if it's stepping stones that get so integrated into the garden you barely can see them, even when you're inside the house. Mm -hmm. So once you've got that firm outline established, you can curve to your heart's content within it and the, and the design will hold. This question is thinking about materials that you use in the garden. You talked about coordinating the, if you have a white trim on the house, you might have a white picket fence. Then within that garden, are there any rules about the materials you use in the garden uh, in relationship to the materials of the white picket fence? You well, know, yeah, using white. Uh, yeah I, I worked with uh, Susie Granville down on the eastern shore of Maryland on a garden, and we, we designed everything white. Every flowering plant, the fence, the um, pergola, the summer house, the furniture around the pool, every single thing in that garden was white. And then we went in with striking contrast, like, uh, 
like the Hasta Sun Power, that chartreuse, that <coughs> striking chartreuse. Or, so we might underplant a couple of crab apple trees with that. Or, so what I'm getting at in this answer is that if you want, and we run the risk of being, we ran the risk of being designy when we did that. Do you know what I mean? It was almost a little, we were flirting with Ralph Lauren there. It was getting a little, <laughs> a little scary because it was getting a little too, too. Um, so what you might want to do, particularly in rural Iowa, which is, I mean, rural Vermont is the same thing. You can't get too self-conscious or you're going to just sort of become dishonest. Um, is that you've got a white house, you put a white fence, Maybe you get a white, you know those beautiful white um, uh, posts with a, with a cedar bird house on top of it? Put that right in the middle, it's got a white post with a cedar, and then drop the white from that point on. And keep it easy in lots of different colors, but stay within that white to a point. This person has a, a painted lady Victorian home. Mm. She has wonderful colors on her home. And she's concerned she doesn't know if a formal design would, with her garden, if her gardens should be a formal design or how you would work with a Victorian home. Can you successfully blend a formal design <coughs> with this home? Well, I think that if, if, if it's, if you have restored a Victorian home and painted it the way it would have been painted, I would stick with foundation planting. That was when the idea developed up in Chicago. And stay, and maybe you don't go to the, the traditional use rhododendrons and, and, and junipers. Maybe you, you just use boxwood or you just use yew. Um, I did this on a house down in Southport, Connecticut. We, we planted boxwood that were about this high and about that deep and we ran it right across the whole front of the house so it's like a table on on which the house sits when seen from the driveway and then let that lawn run out just as it would have a um, hundred years ago because you've done a historic restoration of the house the garden should come along with it having said that when you get out back I think there uh, you, could, you could run a straight path right off the back door of that house on out into that lawn and start to develop a really interesting formal garden out back. But I sure wouldn't get too gardeny out front for fear of competing with an extraordinary piece of architecture and paint job. That is, you need to know when not to, to plant. So would you work a gazebo into this, this, this person's oh, thinking about a Victorians gazebo? Oh, Victorians would have used a gazebo. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Anything? I thought I heard something. Any suggestions for designing gardens on a corner lot? Yes. Um, see, I'm just full of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I, I've got a picture in, in, or I've got an illustration in my book, Your House, Your Garden. A corner lot, the corner of a house um, is a tricky place, particularly if you're right in a community, because you can't obscure view lines for cars that come up to that corner and have to see if traffic is coming to, from the right or, or from the left or however it works. So that's going to have a big impact on how you design that garden. It's going to, it, you just have to be sure that you're going to fit within municipal rules because there probably are municipal regulations regarding corner lots. But once you've assured yourself that you're not going to create any problem, get a, um, what you might do is get a three foot high cardboard box or get five or six of them and lay them out, presuming you're on a flat property, lay them out, get in your own car and drive up to that corner and see if you can see at three feet, or if it should be at two feet, or if you could go to four feet, or how far back could those cardboard boxes go until you can start to build up 
But one of the things about a corner lot is that it, it feels that corner window or the windows that are, are along the two sides that form the corner feel very exposed to traffic. And so if you can find a good point where a fence could go in and where some filmy things like grasses, ornamental grasses might go, or shrubs that have a very open habit um, can go so that you can still see through them a little bit if you feel you need to, or if you, if you want to make it denser, get into something. Uh, I saw Jim Rose, a designer in Ridgewood, New Jersey, who put an eight-foot fence up 12 feet from his sidewalk, planted that whole 12-foot section with low skimmia, do you know skimmia and little low evergreens, then up comes the eight foot fence and then he's got a hole behind it, he's got a 10, 12 foot high um, set of shrubs behind it. So he, when he's in his house, he doesn't see a single car. There is absolutely nothing. Now he was the most irascible garden designer I ever met. Well, the most irascible person I think I've ever met in my life. He was a curmudgeon. And so he just lived in his own private world and the rest of the world could go hang as far as he was concerned. That's not how most of us behave. So what you have to find, I think, and this may be the main point, is you have to find how comfortable you are as a neighbor, as a member of a community, how comfortable you are really shutting off that, that, those corner lots from from the life out lived in the community. Okay. We have a split level house. Two windows are level with the grade of the front yard. Any tips for trees, shrubs, or plants around these windows? And is the snow coming <coughs> off? Is snow a problem right around the perimeter of your house here? Will they destroy shrubs? Not or don't you get enough snow to? You have it. Not very much. We don't, we don't get that much snow. Uh-huh. 30, 30 inches. Right, yeah. right. It's been a few right. years. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't had many. Yeah. Well, you need light coming in those windows, I presume. Who's, whose question is this? You need light coming in those windows, right? They have shrubs planted there. They're deciduous, but they're not in very good shape. So there is a lot of light going through the, the plant. Yeah. Well, get them out of there. It's. That's another thing is you've got to be brave and you've got to know when to just get the things out. <laughs> but what I would do, I would think, is to start, now I don't know if this is comfortable for you or not, but let's say you measure that wall of the house, you work out it's 20 feet or so, flop that dimension down, and do your interesting garden 20 feet away from the house, and then right around near those windows, go real low with sedum, spurium, John Creech, or, or a juga, or real low ground covers, so that light is going to pour into those windows, but you've screened out 15, 18, 20 feet. And then over time, work a whole garden into that. And then you get, you get everything you want, I think, is a, is a garden plus light in those windows. I hope I understand this correctly. This says, you talked about small structures in the garden. How would you incorporate a 200-year-old white maple? Is that correct? Silver I'm maple. Oh, silver maple. Uh, 15 feet from the house into your design. 200-year-old silver maple? It's gigantic. It takes four people to put our eyes <gasps> on it. Wow. And it's, it's, well, this one, that's what the tree guy said it was. But, I mean, it's huge. And it's... Yeah right where a normal person would put a garden. But it shaded the whole house all summer. That's yeah, why they planted yeah. it. See, I wouldn't plant anything around it. Just that, well, I'm reading Frank Lloyd Wright's approach to landscape design now. He, he's got a book called Wrightscapes. And um, he didn't write it, but it's the summary of, of his thinking about it. And he would regard that tree as the most beautiful thing on that property and he wouldn't do anything to take away from it. And that's one of the dangers of planting at the base of big trees or even wonderful, you know, beautiful decorative trees is that you draw the eye to the ground rather than drawing the eye to the magnificence 
of this tree. So I, I wouldn't do a thing near it. I would let that be the be-all and end-all of that part of your garden. Having said that, don't let it dominate. That is, when you get away at a reasonable distance, then draw some lines between it and the rest of your garden and get more delicate in other areas. Yeah, and focus a lot of attention on that tree. It could become the focus. <clears throat> I mean, if, you, <clears throat> if you're way back in your property and you're looking down toward that tree, I would make sure that an opening or a gateway and a fence was right on line with that tree. Yeah, so that you're saying, take a look at that tree. You know, it's the, it's the, it's the heart of your garden. That is the extent of my written questions. Did something pop into someone's mind? We're about ready to quit now. I have to stop. Let me, let me tell you a little bit, just for a second. Thank you, Gordon. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about next, our next forum, which will be the last forum for the spring. This will be the second Sunday in April. We are going to have Richard Shepherdson and Jackie Alsop speak to us, and they're going to talk to us about water in the garden. Uh, the Shepherdsons have just built a lovely new home with a great pond and he did it he is going to tell us about how he built that pond and all the mistakes he made and the things that you can learn from him if you're interested jackie has spoken for a long time about all sorts of water interest in the garden so if you're not wanting to do a pond but you're ready to have just a little little burbler or whatever you call those things by the front door or use water in even a small way that can be very very effective these people will have lots of wonderful things for us to learn. So I think it's the 9th of, of April, the second Sunday in April. We're going back to the library, 2 o'clock in the afternoon on the second Sunday in April, and we'll see you then. Thank you very much for coming. Excuse me. Oh. Please, excuse me. I'm sorry. I, I never really, really thanked Gordon properly well, for giving us did. such a wonderful, wonderful presentation. So let's get on.